Section 71 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV. Literature and Art. Part 6. Racine had just brought out Alexandre when he became connected with Boileau, who was three years his senior, and who had already published several of his satires. Quote, I have a surprising facility in writing my verses, said the young tragic author ingenuously. Quote, I want to teach you to write them with difficulty, answered Boileau, and you have talent enough to learn before long. End quote. Andromaque was the result of this novel effort, and was Racine's real commencement. He was henceforth irrevocably committed to the theatrical cause nicole attacking desmarets who had turned prophet after the failure of his clovis alluded to the author's comedies and exclaimed with all the severity of port royal quote, a romance writer and a scenic poet is a public poisoner not of bodies but of souls end quote. racine took these words to himself and he wrote in defence of the dramatic art two letters so bitter biting and insulting towards port royal and the protectors of his youth that Boileau dissuaded him from publishing the second, and that remorse before long took possession of his soul, never to be entirely appeased. He had just brought out Les Pladeurs, which had been requested of him by his friends and partly composed during the dinners they frequently had together. Quote, I put into it only a few barbarous law terms which I might have picked up during a lawsuit, and which neither I nor my judges ever really heard or understood. End quote. After the first failure of the piece, the king's comedians one day risked playing it before him. Quote, Louis the fourteenth was struck by it, and did not think it a breach of his dignity or taste to utter shouts of laughter so loud that the courtiers were astounded. End quote. The delighted comedians, on leaving Versailles, returned straight to Paris, and went to awaken Racine. Quote, Three carriages during the night in a street where it was unusual to see a single one during the day woke up the neighbourhood. There was a rush to the windows, and as it was known that a councillor of requests, or law officer, had made a great uproar against the comedy of Le Plaideur, nobody had a doubt of punishment befalling the poet who had dared to take off the judges in the open theatre. Next day all Paris believed that he was in prison. He had a triumph, on the contrary, with Britannicus, after which the king gave up dancing in the court ballets for fear of resembling Nero. Berenice was a duel between Corneille and Racine for the amusement of Madame Henriette. Racine bore away the bell from his illustrious rival without much glory. Bajazet soon followed. Quote, Here is Racine's piece, wrote Madame de Sévigny to her daughter in January 1672. If I could send you La Chamelle, you would think it good, but without her it loses half its worth. The character of Bajazet is cold as ice. The manners of the Turks are ill observed in it. They do not make so much fuss about getting married. The catastrophe is not well led up to. There are no reasons given for that great butchery. There are some pretty things, however, but nothing perfectly beautiful, nothing which carries by storm, none of those bursts of Corneille's which make one creep. My dear, let us be careful never to compare Racine with him. Let us always feel the difference. Never will the former rise any higher than Andromaque. Long live our old friend Corneille. Let us forgive his bad verses for the sake of those divine and sublime beauties which transport us. They are master strokes which are inimitable. End quote. Corneille had seen Bajazet. Quote, I would take great care not to say so to anybody else, he whispered in the ear of Sagret, who was sitting beside him, because they would say that I said so from jealousy, but mind you, there is not in Bajazet a single character with the sentiments which should and do prevail at Constantinople. They have all, beneath a Turkish dress, the sentiments that prevail in the midst of France. End quote. The impassioned loyalty of Madame de Sévigny and the clear-sighted jealousy of Corneille were not mistaken. Bajazet is no Turk, but he is none the less very human. Quote, there are points by which men recognize themselves though there is no resemblance there are others in which there is resemblance without any recognition certain sentiments belong to nature in all countries they are characteristic of man only and everywhere man will see his own image in them corneille et son temps by m guizot racine's reputation went on continually increasing he had brought out mithridati and iphigenie phedra appeared in sixteen seventy seven a cabal of great lords caused its failure at first when the public, for a moment led astray after the Phèdre of Pradon, returned to the masterwork of Racine, vexation and wounded pride had done their office in the poet's soul. Pious sentiments ever smouldering in his heart, the horror felt for the theatre by Port Royal, and penitence for the sins he had been guilty of against his friends there, revived within him, and Racine gave up profane poetry forever. Quote, 
the applause i have met with has often flattered me a great deal said he at a later period to his son but the smallest critical censure bad as it may have been always caused me more of vexation than all the praises have given me of pleasure End quote. Racine wanted to turn Carthusian, his confessor dissuaded him, and his friends induced him to marry. Madame Racine was an excellent person, modest and devout, who never went to the theatre, and scarcely knew her husband's plays by name. She brought him some fortune. The king had given the great poet a pension, and Colbert had appointed him to the treasury, or trésorier, at Moulin. Louis the Fourteenth, moreover, granted frequent donations to men of letters. Racine received from him nearly fifty thousand livres. He was appointed historiographer to the king. Boileau received the same title. The latter was not married, but Racine before long had seven children. Quote, Why did not I turn Carthusian? he would sometimes exclaim in the disquietude of his paternal affection when his children were ill. He devoted his life to them with pious solicitude, constantly occupied with their welfare, their good education, and the salvation of their souls. Several of his daughters became nuns. He feared above everything to see his eldest son devote himself to poetry, dreading for him the dangers he considered he himself had run. Quote, As for your epigram, I wish you had not written it, he wrote to him. Independently of its being commonplace, I cannot too earnestly recommend you not to let yourself give way to the temptation of writing French verses, which would serve no purpose but to distract your mind. Above all, you should not write against anybody. End quote. This son, the object of so much care, to whom his father wrote such modest, grave, paternal, and sagacious letters, never wrote verses, lived in retirement, and died young without ever having married. Little Louis, or Léon Val, Racine's last child, was the only one who ever dreamed of being a writer. Quote, you must be very bold, said Boileau to him, to dare write verses with the name you bear. It is not that I consider it impossible for you to become capable some day of writing good ones, but I mistrust what is without precedent, and never, since the world was world, has there been seen a great poet's son of a great poet. Louis Racine never was a great poet, in spite of the fine verses which are to be met with in his poems La Religion and La Grâce. His memoir of his father, written for his son, describe Racine in all the simple charm of his domestic life. Quote, he would leave all to come and see us, writes Louis Racine. An equerry of the Duke's came one day to say that he was expected to dinner at Condé's house. I shall not have the honour of going, said he. It is more than a week since I have seen my wife and children, who are making holiday to-day to feast with me on a very fine carp. I cannot give up dining with them. And when the equerry persisted, he sent for the carp, which was worth about a crown. Judge for yourself, said he, whether I can disappoint these poor children, who have made up their minds to regale me, and would not enjoy it if they were to eat this dish without me. He was loving by nature, adds Louis Racine. He was loving towards God when he returned to him and from the day of his return to those who, from his infancy, had taught him to know him, he was so towards them without any reserve. He was so all his life towards his friends, towards his wife, and towards his children. Boileau had undertaken the task of reconciling his friend with Port Royal. Nicole had made no opposition, quote, not knowing what war was. End quote. M. Arnaud was intractable. Boileau one day made up his mind to take him a copy of Phèdre, pondering on the way as to what he should say to him. Quote, shall this man, said he, be always right, and shall I never be able to prove him wrong? I am quite sure that I shall be right to-day. If he is not of my opinion, he will be wrong. End quote. And going to M. Arnaud's, where he found a large company, he set about developing his thesis, pulling out Phèdre, and maintaining that if tragedy were dangerous, it was the fault of the poets. The younger theologians listened to him disdainfully, but at last M. Arnaud said out loud, quote, If things are as he says, he is right, and such tragedy is harmless. End quote. Boileau declared that he had never felt so pleased in his life. M. Arnaud being reconciled to Phèdre, the principal step was made. Next day the author of the tragedy presented himself. The culprit entered, humility and confusion depicted on his face. He threw himself at the feet of M. Arnaud, who took him in his arms. Racine was thenceforth received into favour by Port Royal. The two friends were preparing to set out with the king for the campaign of 1677. The besieged towns opened their gates before the poets had left Paris. Quote, how is it that you had not the curiosity to see a siege? The king asked them on his return. It was not a long trip. Quote, True, sir, answered Racine, always the greater courtier of the two, but our tailors were too slow. We had ordered travelling suits, and when they were brought home, the places which your majesty was besieging were taken. End quote. Louis the Fourteenth was not displeased. Racine thenceforth accompanied him in all his campaigns. Boileau, who ailed a great deal, and was of shy disposition, remained at Paris. His friend wrote to him constantly, at one time from the camp, and at another from Versailles, whither he returned with the king. Quote, Madame de Maintenon told me this morning, writes Racine, 
that the king had fixed our pensions at four thousand francs for me and two thousand for you that is not including our literary pensions i have just come from thanking the king i laid more stress upon your case than even my own i said in as many words sir he has more wit than ever more zeal for your majesty and more desire to work for your glory than ever he had i am nevertheless really pained at the idea of my getting more than you but independently of the expenses and fatigue of the journeys from which i am glad that you are delivered i know that you are so noble-minded and so friendly that i am sure you would be heartily glad that i were even better treated i shall be very pleased if you are boileau answered at once quote, are you mad with your compliments do not you know perfectly well that it was i who suggested the way in which things have been done and can you doubt of my being perfectly well pleased with a matter in which i am accorded all i ask nothing in the world could be better and i am even more rejoiced on your account than on my own the two friends consulted one another mutually about their verses racine sent boileau his spiritual songs the king heard the combat du chrétien sung set to music by moreau quote, o god my god what deadly strife two men within myself i see one would that full of love to thee my heart were leal in death and life the other with rebellion rife against thy laws inciteth me End quote. he turned to madame de maintenon and quote, madame said he i know those two men well End quote. boileau sends racine his ode on the capture of namur quote, i have risked some very new things he says even to speaking of the white plume which the king has in his hat but in my opinion if you are to have novel expressions in verse you must speak of things which have not been said in verse you shall be judged with permission to alter the whole if you do not like it boileau's generous confidence was the more touching in that racine was sarcastic and bitter in discussion quote, did you mean to hurt me boileau said to him one day quote, god forbid was the answer quote, well then you made a mistake for you did hurt me End quote. Racine had just brought out Esther at the Theatre of Saint-Cyr. Madame de Brinon, lady superior of the establishment which was founded by Madame de Maintenon for the daughters of poor noblemen, had given her pupils a taste for theatricals. Quote, Our little girls have just been playing your Andromaque, wrote Madame de Maintenon to Racine, and they played it so well that they never shall play it again in their lives or any other of your pieces. End quote. She at the same time asked him to write, in his leisure hours, some sort of moral and historical poem from which love should be altogether banished. This letter threw Racine into a great state of commotion. He was anxious to please Madame de Maintenon, and yet it was a delicate commission for a man who had a great reputation to sustain. Boileau was for refusing. Quote, that was not in the calculations of Racine, says Madame de Caylus in her souvenir. He wrote Esther. Quote, Madame de Maintenon was charmed with the conception and the execution, says Madame de Lafayette. The play represented in some sort the fall of Madame de Montespan and her own elevation. All the difference was that Esther was a little younger, and less particular in the matter of piety. The way in which the characters were applied was the reason why Madame de Maintenon was not sorry to make public a piece which had been composed for the community only, and for some of her private friends there was exhibited a degree of excitement about it which is incomprehensible not one of the small or the great but would go to see it and that which ought to have been looked upon as merely a convent play became the most serious matter in the world the ministers to pay their court by going to this play left their most pressing business at the first representation at which the king was present he took none but the principal officers of his hunt the second was reserved for pious personages such as father lachaise and a dozen or fifteen jesuits with many other devotees of both sexes afterwards it extended to the courtiers quote, i paid my court at st cyr the other day more agreeably than i had expected writes madame de sevigny to her daughter listened marshal belfond and i with an attention that was remarked and with certain discreet commendations which were not perhaps to be found beneath the headdresses of all the ladies present i cannot tell you how exceedingly delightful this piece is it is a unison of music verse songs persons so perfect that there is nothing left to desire the girls who act the kings and other characters were made expressly for it everything is simple everything innocent everything sublime and affecting i was charmed and so was the marshal who left his place to go and tell the king how pleased he was and that he sat beside a lady well worthy of having seen us there the king came over to our seats madame he said to me i am assured that you have been pleased i without any confusion replied sir i am charmed what i feel is beyond expression the king said to me racine is very clever i said to him very sir but really these young people are very clever too they throw themselves into the subject as if they had never done aught else ah as to that he replied it is quite true and then his majesty went away and left me the object of envy the prince and princess came and gave me a word madame de maintenon a glance she went away with the king 
I replied to all, for I was in luck. Atali had not the same brilliant success as Esther. The devotee and the envious had affrighted Madame de Maintenon, who had requested Racine to write it. The young ladies of Saint Cyr, in the uniform of the house, played the piece quite simply at Versailles before Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon in a room without a stage. When the players gave a representation of it at Paris, it was considered heavy. It did not succeed. Racine imagined that he was doomed to another failure like that of Phèdre, which he preferred before all his other pieces. Quote, I am a pretty good judge, Boileau kept repeating to him. It is about the best you have done. The public will come round to it. End quote. Racine died before success was achieved by the only perfect piece which the French stage possesses, worthy both of the subject and of the sources whence Racine drew his inspiration. He had, with an excess of scrupulousness, abandoned the display of all the fire that burned within him, but beauty never ceased to rouse him to irresistible enthusiasm. Whilst reading the psalms to M. de Seignelay, when lying ill, he could not refrain from paraphrasing them aloud. He admired Sophocles so much that he never dared touch the subjects of his tragedies. Quote, one day, says M. de Valicourt, when he was at Auteuil, at Boileau's, with M. Nicole and some distinguished friends, he took up a Sophocles in Greek, and read the tragedy of Oedipus, translating it as he went. He read so feelingly that all his auditors experienced the sensations of terror and pity with which this piece abounds. I have seen our best pieces played by our best actors, but nothing ever came near the commotion into which I was thrown by this reading, and at this moment of writing I fancy I still see Racine, book in hand, and all of us awe-stricken around him." Thus it was that, whilst repeating but a short time before the verses of Mithridate as he was walking in the Tuileries, he had seen the workmen leaving their work and coming up to him, convinced as they were that he was mad, and was going to throw himself into the basin. End of section 71《セクション72 of a Popular History of France, Volume 5。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot。Translated by Robert Black。Chapter 48 。Louis XIV, Literature and Art, Part 7 。Racine for a long while enjoyed the favours of the king, who went so far as to tolerate the attachment the poet had always testified towards Port Royal. Racine, moreover, showed tact in humouring the susceptibilities of Louis the Fourteenth and his counsellors. Father Bonheur and Father Rapin, Jesuits, were in my study when I received your letter, he writes to Boileau. I read it to them on breaking the seal, and I gave them very great pleasure. I kept looking ahead, however, as I was reading, in case there was anything too Jansenistical in it. I saw towards the end the name of M. Nicole, and I skipped boldly, or rather mean-spiritedly, over it. I dared not expose myself to the chance of interfering with the great delight, and even shouts of laughter, caused them by many very amusing things you sent me. They are both of them, I assure you, very friendly towards you, and indeed very good fellows." All this caution did not prevent Racine, however, from displeasing the king. After a conversation he had held with Madame de Maintenon about the miseries of the people, she asked him for a memorandum on the subject. The king demanded the name of the author, and flew out at him. Quote, because he is a perfect master of verse, said he, does he think he knows everything, and because he is a great poet, does he want to be minister? End quote. Madame de Maintenon was more discreet in her relations with the king than bold in the defence of her friends. She sent Racine word not to come and see her until further orders. Quote, Let this cloud pass, she said, I will bring the fine weather back. End quote. Racine was ill, his naturally melancholy disposition had become sombre. Quote, I know, madame, he wrote to madame de Maintenon, what influence you have, but in the house of Port Royal I have an aunt who shows her affection for me in quite a different way. This holy woman is always praying God to send me disgraces, humiliations, and subjects for penitence. She will have more success than you." At bottom his soul was not sturdy enough to endure the rough doctrines of Port Royal. His health got worse and worse. He returned to court. He was readmitted by the king, who received him graciously. Racine continued uneasy. He had an abscess of the liver, and was a long while ill. Quote, when he was convinced that he was going to die, he ordered a letter to be written to the superintendent of finances, asking for payment, which was due, of his pension. His son brought him the letter. Why, said he, did you not ask for payment of Boileau's pension, too? We must not be made distinct. Write the letter over again, and let Boileau know that I was his friend even to death. When the latter came to wish him farewell, he raised himself up in bed with an effort. I regard it as a happiness for me to die before you, he said to his friend. An operation appeared necessary. His son would have given him hopes. 
and you too said racine you would do as the doctors and mock me god is the master and can restore me to life but death has sent in his bill End quote. he was not mistaken on the twenty first of april sixteen ninety nine the great poet the scrupulous christian the noble and delicate painter of the purest passions of the soul expired at paris at fifty nine years of age leaving life without regret spite of all the successes with which he had been crowned unlike corneille with the cid he did not take tragedy and glory by assault he conquered them both by degrees raising himself at each new effort and gaining over little by little the most passionate admirers of his great rival at the pinnacle of this reputation and this victory at thirty-eight years of age he had voluntarily shut the door against the intoxications and pride of success he had mutilated his life buried his genius in penitence obeying simply the calls of his conscience and with singular moderation in the very midst of exaggeration becoming a father of a family and remaining a courtier at the same time that he gave up the stage in glory racine was gentle and sensible even in his repentance and his sacrifices boileau gave religion the credit for this very moderation Quote, reason commonly brings others to faith it was faith which brought m racine to reason End quote. boileau had more to do with his friend's reason than he probably knew racine never acted without consulting him with racine boileau lost half his life he survived him twelve years without ever setting foot again within the court after his first interview with the king quote, i have been at versailles he writes to his publisher m brossette where I saw Madame de Maintenon, and afterwards the king, who overcame me with kind words. So here I am, more historiographer than ever. His Majesty spoke to me of M. Racine in a manner to make courtiers desire death, if they thought he would speak of them in the same way afterwards. Meanwhile that has been but very small consolation to me for the loss of that illustrious friend, who is none the less dead, though regretted by the greatest king in the universe. Quote, Remember, Louis the Fourteenth had said, that I have always an hour a week to give you when you like to come. End quote boileau did not go again quote, what should i go to court for he would say i cannot sing praises any more at racine's death boileau did not write any longer he had entered the arena of letters at three-and-twenty after a sickly and melancholy childhood the art poétique and the lutrin appeared in sixteen seventy four the first nine satires and several of the epistles had preceded them Rather a witty, shrewd, and able versifier than a great poet, Boileau displayed in the Lutrin a richness and suppleness of fancy which his other works had not foreshadowed. The broad and cynical buffoonery of Scarron's burlesques had always shocked his severe and pure taste. Quote, Your father was weak enough to read Virgile Travesti and laugh over it, he would say to Louis Racine, but he kept it dark from me. End quote. In the Lutrin, Boileau sought the gay and the laughable under noble and polished forms the gay lost by it the laughable remained stamped with an ineffaceable seal quote, m de pro wrote racine to his son has not only received from heaven a marvellous genius for satire but he has also together with that an excellent judgment which makes him discern what needs praise and what needs blame End quote. this marvellous genius for satire did not spoil boileau's natural good feeling quote, he is cruel in verse only madame de sevigny used to say racine was tart bitter in discussion boileau always preserved his coolness his judgments frequently anticipated those of posterity the king asked him one day who was the greatest poet of his reign quote, moliere sir answered boileau without hesitation quote, i shouldn't have thought it rejoined the king somewhat astonished but you know more about it than i do End quote. moliere in his turn defending la fontaine against the pleasantries of his friends said to his neighbour at one of those social meals in which the illustrious friends delighted quote, let us not laugh at the good soul or bonhomme he will probably live longer than the whole of us End quote. in the noble and touching brotherhood of these great minds boileau continued invariably to be the bond between the rivals intimate friend as he was of racine he never quarrelled with moliere and he hurried to the king to beg that he would pass on the pension with which he honoured him to the aged corneille groundlessly deprived of the royal favours he entered the academy on the third of july sixteen eighty four immediately after la fontaine his satires had retarded his election quote, he praised without flattery he humbled himself nobly says louis racine and when he said that admission to the academy was sure to be closed against him for so many reasons he set a thinking all the academicians he had spoken ill of in his work End quote. he was no longer writing verses when perrault published his parallèle des anciens et des modernes quote, if boileau do not reply said the prince of conti you may assure him that i will go to the academy and write on his chair Brutus, thou sleepest. End quote. The ode on the capture of Namur, intended to crush Perrault whilst celebrating Pindar, 
not being sufficient, Boileau wrote his Réflexions sur Longin, bitter and often unjust towards Perrault, who was far more equitably treated and more effectually refuted in Fenelon's letter to the French Academy. Boileau was by this time old. He had sold his house at Auteuil, which was so dear, but he did not give up literature, continuing to revise his verses carefully, preoccupied with new editions, and reproaching himself for this preoccupation. Quote, it is very shameful, he would say, to be still busying myself with rhymes and all those Parnassian trifles, when I ought to be thinking of nothing but the account I am prepared to go and render to God. End quote. He died on the 13th of March, 1711, leaving nearly all he had to the poor. He was followed to the tomb by a great throng. Quote, he had many friends, was the remark amongst the people, and yet we are assured that he spoke evil of everybody. End quote. No writer ever contributed more than Boileau to the formation of poetry. No more correct or shrewd judgment ever assessed the merits of authors. No loftier spirit ever guided a stronger and a juster mind. Through all the vicissitudes undergone by literature, in spite of the sometimes excessive severity of his decrees, Boileau has left an ineffaceable impression upon the French language. His talent was less effective than his understanding. His judgment and his character have had more influence than his verses. Boileau had survived all his friends. La Fontaine, born in 1621 at Chateau Thierry, had died in 1695. He had entered in his youth the brotherhood of the oratory, which he had soon quitted, being unable, he used to say, to accustom himself to theology. He went and came between town and town, amusing himself everywhere, and already writing a little. Quote, For me the whole round world was laden with delights. My heart was touched by flower, sweet sound, and sunny day. I was the sot of friends and eke of Lady Gay." End quote. Fontaine was married without caring much for his wife, whom he left to live alone at Chateau Thierry. He was in great favor with Fouquet. When his patron was disgraced, in danger of his life, La Fontaine put into the mouth of the nymphs of Vaux his touching appeal to the king's clemency. Quote, May he then o'er the life of high-souled Henry Poor, who with the power to take, for vengeance yearned no more. Oh, into Louis's soul this gentle spirit breathe. End quote. Later on, during Fouquet's imprisonment at Pignerol, La Fontaine wrote further, quote, I sigh to think upon the object of my prayers. You take my sense, Ariste. Your generous nature shares the plaints I make for him who so unkindly fares. He did displease the king, and lo, his friends were gone. Forthwith a thousand throats roared out at him like one. I wept for him despite the torrent of his foes. I taught the world to have some pity for his woes. End quote. La Fontaine has been described as a solitary being, without wit and without external charm of any kind. La Bruyère has said, quote, A certain man appears loutish, heavy, stupid. He can neither talk nor relate what he has just seen. He sets himself to writing, and it is a model of story-telling. He makes speakers of animals, trees, stones, everything that cannot speak. There is nothing but lightness and elegance, nothing but natural beauty and delicacy in his works. Quote, he says nothing or will talk of nothing but Plato, Racine's daughters used to say. All his contemporaries, however, of fashion and good breeding, did not form the same opinion of him. The dowager duchess of Orléans, Marguerite of Lorraine, had taken him as one of her gentlemen-in-waiting. The duchess of Bouillon had him in her retinue in the country. Madame de Montespan and her sister, Madame de Tiange, liked to have a visit from him. He lived at the house of Madame de la Sablière, a beauty and a wit, who received a great deal of company. He said of her, quote, warm is her heart, and knit with tenderest ties to those she loves, and elsewise otherwise. For such a sprite, whose birthplace is the skies, of manly beauty blent with woman's grace, no mortal pen, though fain, can fitly trace. Quote. Quote, I have only kept by me, she would say, my three pets, or animaux, my dog, my cat, and La Fontaine. End quote. When she died, Monsieur and Madame Dervard received into their house the now old and somewhat isolated poet. As Dervas was on his way to go and make the proposal to La Fontaine, he met him in the street. Quote, I was coming to ask you to put up at our house, said he. Quote, I was just going thither, answered Fontaine with the most touching confidence. There he remained to his death, contenting himself with going now and then to Chateau Thierry, as long as his wife lived, to sell, with her consent, some strip of ground. The property was going, old age was coming. Quote, John did no better than he had begun, spent property and income both as one of treasure saw small use in any way knew very well how to get through his day split it in two one part as he thought best he passed in sleep did nothing all the rest End quote. he did not sleep he dreamed one day dinner was kept waiting for him quote, i have just come said he as he entered from the funeral of an aunt 
I followed the procession to the cemetery, and I escorted the family home. End quote. It has been said that La Fontaine knew nothing of natural history. He knew and loved animals. Up to his time, fable writers had been merely philosophers or satirists. He was the first who was a poet, unique not only in France but in Europe, discovering the deep and secret charm of nature, animating it with his inexhaustible and graceful genius, giving lessons to men from the example of animals, without making the latter speak like man. Ever supple and natural, sometimes elegant and noble, with penetration beneath the cloak of his simplicity, inimitable in the line which he had chosen from taste, from instinct, and not from want of power to transport his genius elsewhither. He himself has said, quote, Yes, call me truly, if it must be said, Parnasian butterfly, and like the bees wherein old Plato found our similes. Light rover I, forever on the wing, flutter from flower to flower, from thing to thing, with much of pleasure mix a little fame. End quote and in psyche, quote, music and books, and junketings and love, and town and country, all to me is bliss. There nothing is that comes amiss, in melancholy's self-grim joy I prove, end quote. The grace, the naturalness, the original independence of the mind and the works of La Fontaine had not the luck to please Louis the Fourteenth, who never accorded him any favour, and La Fontaine did not ask for any, quote, all dumb I shrink once more within my shell, where unobtrusive pleasures dwell, True, I shall here by fortune be forgot, her favours with my verse agree not well, to importune the gods beseems me not. End quote. Once only, from the time of Fouquet's trial, the poet demanded a favour. Louis the Fourteenth, having misgivings about the propriety of the Comte of La Fontaine, had not yet given the assent required for his election to the French Academy, when he set out for the campaign in Luxembourg. La Fontaine addressed to him a ballad. Quote, just as in Homer Jupiter we see alone o'er all the other gods prevail. You, one against a hundred though it be, balance all Europe in the other scale. Them like an eye to those who in the tale, mountain on mountain piled, presumptuously warring with heaven and Jove. The earth clave he, and hurled them down beneath huge rocks to wail. So take you up your bolt with energy, a happy consummation cannot fail. Sweet thought, that doth this month or two avail, to somewhat soothe my muse's anxious care. For certain minds at certain stories rail, certain poor jests which naught but trifles are. If I with deference their lessons hail, what would they more? Be you more prone to spare, more kind than they, less sheathed in rigorous mail. Prince, in a word, your real self declare, a happy consummation cannot fail. The election of Boileau to the Academy appeased the king's humour, who preferred the other's intellect to that of La Fontaine. Quote, the choice you have made of M. Despreaux is very gratifying to me, he said to the board of the Academy. It will be approved of by everybody. You can admit La Fontaine at once. He has promised to be good. End quote. It was a rash promise, which the poet did not always keep. The friends of La Fontaine had but lately wanted to reconcile him to his wife. They had with that view sent him to Chateau Thierry. He returned without having seen her whom he went to visit. Quote, My wife was not at home, said he. She had gone to the Sacrement, or Salut. End quote. He was becoming old. Those same faithful friends, Racine, Boileau, and Maucroix, were trying to bring him home to God. Racine took him to church with him. A testament was given him. Quote, that is a very good book, said he. I assure you it is a very good book. End quote. Then all at once addressing Abbe Boileau, quote, Doctor, do you think that St. Augustin was as clever as Rabelais? End quote. He was ill, however, and began to turn towards eternity his dreamy and erratic thoughts. He had set about composing pious hymns. Quote, the best of thy friends has not a fortnight to live, he wrote to Maucroix. For two months I have not been out, unless to go to the academy for amusement. Yesterday, as I was returning, I was seized in the middle of Rue du Chantre with a fit of such great weakness that I really thought I was dying. Oh, my dear friend, to die is nothing, but thinkest thou that I am about to appear before God? Thou knowest how I have lived. Before thou hast this letter, the gates of eternity will perchance be opened for me. End quote. Quote, he is as simple as a child, said the woman who took care of him in his last illness. If he has done amiss, it was from ignorance rather than wickedness. End quote. A charming and a curious being, serious and simple, profound and childlike, winning, by reason of his very vagaries, his good-natured originality, his helplessness in common life, La Fontaine knew how to estimate the literary merits as well as the moral qualities of his illustrious friends. Quote, when they happened to be together, says he in his tale of Psyche, and had talked to their hearts content of their diversions, if they chanced to stumble upon any point of science or literature, they profited by the occasion, 
without, however, lingering too long over one and the same subject, but flitting from one topic to another, like bees that meet as they go with different sorts of flowers. Envy, malignity, or cabal had no voice amongst them. They adored the works of the ancients, refused not the moderns the praises which were their due, spoke of their own with modesty, and gave one another honest advice when any one of them fell ill of the malady of the age and wrote a book, which happened now and then. In this case, Acanthus, or Racine, did not fail to propose a walk in some place outside the town, in order to hear the reading with less noise and more pleasure. He was extremely fond of gardens, flowers, foliage. Folifil, or La Fontaine, resembled him in this, but then Folifil might be said to love all things. Both of them were lyrically inclined, with this difference, that Acanthus was rather the more pathetic, Polyphil the more ornate." End quote. When La Fontaine died on the 13th of April, 1695, of the four friends lately assembled at Versailles to read the tale of Psyche, Molière alone had disappeared. La Fontaine had admired at Vaux the young comic poet, who had just written the Fâcheux for the entertainment given by Fouquet to Louis XIV. Quote, it is a work by Molière. This writer, of a style so rare, is nowadays the court's delight. His fame, so rapid is its flight, beyond the bounds of Rome must be. Amen, for he's the man for me. End quote. In his old age he gave vent to his grief and his regret at Molière's death in this touching epitaph. Quote, Beneath this stone Plautus and Terence lie. Though lieth here but Molière alone, their threefold gifts of mind made up but one, that witched all France with noble comedy. Now are they gone, and little hope have I that we again shall look upon the three dead men. Methinks, while countless years roll by, Terentius, Plautus, Molière will be. End, quote. End of section 72. Section 73 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV, Literature and Art. Part 8. Molière and French comedy had no need to take shelter beneath the mantle of the ancients. They, together, had shed upon the world incomparable luster. Shakespeare might dispute with Corneille and Racine the sceptre of tragedy. He had succeeded in showing himself as full of power, with more truth as the one, and as full of tenderness with more profundity as the other. Molière is superior to him in originality, abundance, and perfection of characters. He yields to him neither in range, nor penetration, nor complete knowledge of human nature. The lives of these two great geniuses, authors and actors both together, present in other respects certain features of resemblance. Both were intended for another career than that of the stage. Both, carried away by an irresistible passion, assembled about them a few actors, leading at first a roving life, to end by becoming the delight of the court and of the world. John Baptist Poquelin, who before long assumed the name of Molière, was born at Paris in 1622. His father, upholstery groom of the chamber, or valet de chambre tapissier, to Louis XIV, had him educated with some care at Clermont afterwards louis le grand college then in the hands of the jesuits he attended by favour the lessons which the philosopher gassendi for a long time the opponent of descartes gave young chapelle he imbibed at these lessons together with a more extensive course of instruction a certain freedom of thinking which frequently cropped out in his plays and contributed later on to bring upon him an accusation of irreligion in sixteen forty five or possibly sixteen forty three Molière had formed with the ambitious title of Illustré Théâtre a small company of actors who, being unable to maintain themselves at Paris, for a long while tramped the provinces through all the troubles of the Fronde. It was in 1653 that Molière brought out at Lyon his comedy Les Tordis, the first regular piece he had ever composed. The Dépit Amoureux was played at Béziers in 1656, at the opening of the session of the States of Languedoc. The company returned to Paris in 1658. In 1659, Molière, who had obtained a license from the king, gave at his own theatre Les Précieuses Ridicules. He broke with all imitation of the Italians and the Spaniards, and taking off to the life the manners of his own times, he boldly attacked the affected exaggeration and absurd pretensions of the vulgar imitators of the Hôtel de Rambouillet. Quote, Bravo, Molière, cried an old man from the middle of the pit. This is real comedy. End quote. When he published his piece, Molière, anxious not to give umbrage to a powerful clique, took care to say in his preface that he was not attacking real précieuses, but only the bad imitations. Just as he had recalled Corneille to the stage, Fouquet was for protecting Molière upon it. The École des Mans and the Fâcheux were played at Vaux. 
amongst the ridiculous characters in this latter moliere had not described the huntsman louis the fourteenth himself indicated to him the marquis of soyecourt Quote, there's one you have forgotten he said twenty-four hours later the boar of a huntsman with all his jargon of venery had a place forever amongst the fâcheux of moliere the école des femmes the impromptu de versailles the critique de l'école des femmes began a bellicose period in the great comic poet's life accused of impiety attacked in the honour of his private life moliere returning insult for insult delivered over those amongst his enemies who offered a butt for ridicule to the derision of the court and of posterity the festin de pierre and the signal punishment of the libertine or free thinker were intended to clear the author from the reproach of impiety la princesse de lide and l'amour médecin were but charming interludes in the great struggle henceforth instituted between reality and appearance in sixteen sixty six moliere produced le misanthrope a frank and noble spirit sublime invective against the frivolity perfidious and showy semblances of court Quote, this misanthrope's despitefulness against bad verses was copied from me moliere himself confessed as much to me many a time wrote boileau one day the indignation of alceste is deeper and more universal than that of boileau against bad poets he is disgusted with the court and the world because he is honest virtuous and sincere and sees corruption triumphant around him he is wroth to feel the effects of it in his life and almost in his soul he is a victim to the eternal struggle between good and evil without the strength and the unquenchable hope of christianity the misanthrope is a shriek of despair uttered by virtue excited and almost distraught at the defeat she forebodes the tartuffe was a new effort in the same direction and bolder in that it attacked religious hypocrisy and seemed to aim its blows even at religion itself moliere was a long time working at it the first acts had been played in sixteen sixty four at court under the title of l'hypocrite at the same time as la princesse de lide quote, the king says the account of the entertainment in the gazette de loret saw so much analogy of form between those whom true devotion sets in the way of heaven and those whom an empty ostentation of good deeds does not hinder from committing bad that his extreme delicacy in respect of religious matters could with difficulty brook this resemblance of vice to virtue and though there might be no doubt of the author's good intentions he prohibited the playing of this comedy before the public until it should be quite finished and examined by persons qualified to judge of it so as not to let advantage be taken of it by others less capable of just discernment in the matter though played once publicly in sixteen sixty seven under the title of l'imposteur the piece did not appear definitively on the stage until sixteen sixty nine having undoubtedly excited more scandal by interdiction than it would have done by representation the king's good sense and judgment at last prevailed over the terrors of the truly devout and the resentment of hypocrites he had just seen an impious piece of buffoonery played quote, i should very much like to know said he to the prince of cond who stood up for moliere an old fellow-student of his brother's the prince of conti's why people who are so greatly scandalized at moliere's comedy say nothing about scaramouche quote, the reason of that answered the prince is that scaramouche makes fun of heaven and religion about which those gentry do not care and that moliere makes fun of their own selves which they cannot brook the prince might have added that all the blows in tartuffe a masterpiece of shrewdness force and fearless and deep wrath struck home at hypocrisy whilst waiting for permission to have tartuffe played moliere had brought out le médecin malgré lui l'amphitryon georges dandin and lavare lavishing freely upon them the inexhaustible resources of his genius which was ever ready to supply the wants of kingly and princely entertainments m de porsognac was played for the first time at chambord on the sixth of october sixteen sixty nine a year afterwards on the same stage appeared le bourgeois gentilhomme with the interludes and music of lully the piece was a direct attack upon one of the most frequent absurdities of his day many of the courtiers felt in their hearts that they were attacked there was a burst of wrath at the first representation by which the king had not appeared to be struck moliere thought it was all over with him louis the fourteenth desired to see the piece a second time Quote, you have never written anything yet which has amused me so much your comedy is excellent said he to the poet the court was at once seized with a fit of admiration the king had lavished his benefits upon moliere who had an hereditary post near him as groom of the chamber he had given him a pension of seven thousand livres and the license of the king's theatre he had been pleased to stand godfather to one of his children to whom the duchess of orleans was godmother he had protected him against the superciliousness of certain servants of his bedchamber but all the monarch's puissance and constant favours could not obliterate public prejudice and give the comedian whom they saw every day on the boards the position and rank which his genius deserved 
Moliere's friends urged him to give up the stage. Quote, Your health is going, Boileau would say to him, because the duties of a comedian exhaust you. Why not give it up? Quote, Alas, replied Moliere with a sigh, it is a point of honour that prevents me. Quote, a what? rejoined Boileau. What? To smear your face with a moustache as Scannarelle, and come on the stage to be thrashed with a stick. That is a pretty point of honour for a philosopher like you. End quote. Moliere might probably have followed the advice of Boileau, he might probably have listened to the silent warnings of his failing powers, if he had not been unfortunate and sad. Unhappy in his marriage, justly jealous and yet passionately fond of his wife, without any consolation within him against the bitternesses and vexations of his life, he sought in work and incessant activity the only distractions which had any charm for a high spirit, constantly wounded in its affections and its legitimate pride. Psyche, les fourberies de Scapin, la comtesse d'Escarbagna, betrayed nothing of their author's increasing sadness or suffering. Les femmes savantes had at first but little success. The piece was considered heavy. The marvellous nicety of the portraits, the correctness of the judgments, the delicacy and elegance of the dialogue were not appreciated until later on. Molière had just composed Le Malade Imaginaire, the last of that succession of blows which he had so often dealt the doctors he was more ailing than ever his friends even his actors themselves pressed him not to have any play quote, what would you have me do he replied there are fifty poor workmen who have but their day's pay to live upon what will they do if we have no play i should reproach myself with having neglected to give them bread for one single day if i could really help it moliere had a bad voice a disagreeable hiccough and harsh inflections Quote, he was nevertheless, say his contemporaries, a comedian from head to foot. He seemed to have several voices, everything about him spoke, and by a caper, by a smile, by a wink of the eye and a shake of the head, he conveyed more than the greatest speaker could have done by talking in an hour. End quote. He played as usual on the 17th of February, 1673. The curtain had risen exactly at four o'clock. Molière could hardly stand, and he had a fit during the burlesque ceremony, at the end of the play, whilst pronouncing the word juro. He was icy cold when he went back to Baron's box, who was waiting for him, who saw him home to Rue Richelieu, and who at the same time sent for his wife and two sisters of charity. When he went up again with Madame Molière into the room, the great comedian was dead. He was only fifty-one. It has been a labour of love to go into some detail over the lives, works, and characters of the great writers during the age of Louis the Fourteenth. They did too much honour to their time and their country. They had too great and too deep an effect in France and in Europe upon the successive developments of the human intellect to refuse them an important place in the history of that France to whose influence and glory they so powerfully contributed. Molière did not belong to the French Academy. His profession had shut the doors against him. It was nearly a hundred years after his death, in 1778, that the Academy raised to him a bust beneath which was engraved, quote, Oh, his glory lacks not, ours did lack him, end quote. It was by instinct and of its own free choice that the French Academy had refused to elect a comedian. It had grown, and its liberty had increased under the sway of Louis XIV. In 1672, at the death of Chancellor Seguier, who had become its protector after Richelieu, quote, it was so honoured that the king was graciously pleased to take upon himself this office. The body had gone to thank him. His Majesty desired that the Dauphin should be witness of what passed on an occasion so honourable to literature. After the speech of M. Arlet, archbishop of paris and the man in france with most inborn talent for speaking the king appearing somewhat touched gave the academicians very great marks of esteem inquired the names one after another of those whose faces were not familiar to him who was there in his capacity of simple academician you will let me know what i must do for these gentlemen perhaps m colbert that minister who was so zealous for the fine arts never received an order more in conformity with his own inclinations End quote. From that time the French Academy held its sittings at the Louvre, and as regarded complimentary addresses to the king on state occasions, it took rank with the sovereign bodies. For thirty-five years the Academy had been working at its dictionnaire. From the first the work had appeared interminable. Quote, These six years past they toil at letter F, and I'd be much obliged if destiny would whisper to me, Thou shalt live to G, wrote Bois-Robert to Balzac. The Academy had entrusted Vaugelas with the preparatory labour. It was, says Pellisson, the only way of coming quickly to an end. end a pension, which he had not been paid for a long time past, was revived in his favour. Vaugelas took his plan to Cardinal Richelieu. Quote, well, sir, said the minister, smiling with a somewhat contemptuous air of kindness, you will not forget the word pension in this dictionary. Quote, no, monseigneur, replied M. de Vaugelas, with a profound bow, and still less reconnaissance or gratitude. End quote. 
Vaugelas had finished the first volume of his Remarques sur la langue française, which has ever since remained the basis of all works on grammar. Quote, he had imported into the body of the work a something or other so estimable, or d'honnête homme, and so much frankness that one could scarcely help loving its author. End quote. He was working at the second volume when he died, in 1649, so poor that his creditors seized his papers, making it very difficult for the Academy to recover his memoir. The dictionary, having lost its principal author, went on so slowly that Colbert, curious to know whether the academicians honestly earned their modest medals for attendance, or jetons de présence, which he had assigned to them, came one day unexpectedly to a sitting. He was present at the whole discussion, quote, after which, having seen the attention and care which the Academy was bestowing upon the composition of its dictionary, he said, as he rose, that he was convinced that it could not get on any faster, and his evidence ought to be of so much more the weight and that never man in his position was more laborious or more diligent. End, quote. End of section 73. Section 74 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis the Fourteenth, Literature and Art, Part Nine. The academicians who were men of letters worked at the dictionary. The academicians who were men of fashion had become pretty numerous. Arnaud d'Andilly and M. de Lamoignon, whom the body had honoured by election, declined to join, and the Academy resolved to never elect anybody without a previously expressed desire and request. At the time when M. de Lamoignon declined, the kin, fearing that it might bring the Academy into some disfavour, procured the appointment in his stead of the coadjutor of Strasbourg, Armand de Rouen Subise. Quote, Splendid as your triumph may be, wrote Boileau to M. de Lamoignon, I am persuaded, sir, from what I know of your noble and modest character, that you are very sorry to have caused this displeasure to a body which is after all very illustrious, and that you will attempt to make it manifest to all the earth. I am quite willing to believe that you had good reasons for acting as you have done. End quote. The Academy from that moment regarded the title it conferred as irrevocable. It did not fill up the place of the Abbe de Saint Pierre when it found itself obliged to exclude him from its sittings by order of Louis the Fifteenth. It did not fill up the place of Monseigneur Dupin Loup when he thought proper to send in his resignation. In spite of court intrigues, it from that moment maintained its independence and its dignity. Quote, M. Despreaux, writes the banker Le Verrier to the Duke of Noailles, represented to the Academy with a great deal of heat that all was rack and ruin, since it was nothing more but a cabal of women that put academicians in the place of those who died. Then he read out loud some verses by M. de saint Hilaire. Thus M. Despreaux, before the eyes of everybody, gave M. de saint Hilaire a black ball, and nominated all by himself M. de Mimur. Here, Monseigneur, is proof that there are Romans still in the world, and for the future I will trouble you to call M. Despreaux no longer your dear poet, but your dear Cato. End quote. With his extreme deafness, Boileau had great difficulty in fulfilling his academic duties. He was a member of the Academy of Medals and Inscriptions, founded by Colbert in 1662, quote, in order to render the acts of the king immortal by deciding the legends of the medals struck in his honour. Pontchartrain raised to forty the number of the members of the Petite Académie, extended its functions, and entrusted it thenceforth with the charge of publishing curious documents relating to the history of France. Quote, we had read to us today a very learned work, but rather tiresome, says Boileau to M. Pontchartrain, and we were bored right eruditely. But afterwards there was an examination of another which was much more agreeable, and the reading of which attracted considerable attention. As the reader was put quite close to me, I was in a position to hear and to speak of it. All I ask you to complete the measure of your kindnesses is to be kind enough to let everybody know that, if I am of so little use at the Academy of Medals, it is equally true that I do not, and do not wish to obtain, any pecuniary advantage from it." The Academy of Sciences had already for many years had sittings in one of the rooms of the King's Library. Like the French Academy, it had owed its origin to private meetings at which Descartes, Gassendi, and young Pascal were accustomed to be present. Quote, there are in the world scholars of two sorts, said a note sent to Colbert about the formation of the new academy. One give themselves up to science because it is a pleasure to them. They are content, as the fruit of their labours, with the knowledge they acquire, and if they are known, it is only amongst those with whom they converse unambitiously and for mutual instruction. These are bona fide scholars, whom it is impossible to do without in a design so great as that of the Académie Royale. There are others who cultivate science only as a field which is to give them sustenance, 
and as they see by experience that great rewards fall only to those who make the most noise in the world, they apply themselves especially not to making new discoveries, for hitherto that has not been recompensed, but to whatever may bring them into notice. These are scholars of the fashionable world, and such as one knows best. End quote. Colbert had the true scholar's taste. He had brought Cassini from Italy to take the direction of the new observatory. He had ordered surveys for a general map of France. He had founded the Journal des Savants. Literary men, whether Frenchmen or foreigners, enjoyed the king's bounties. Colbert had even conceived the plan of a universal academy, a veritable forerunner of the Institute. The arts were not forgotten in this grand project. The Academy of Painting and Sculpture dated from the Regency of Anne of Austria. The pretensions of the Masters of Arts, or Maître des Arts, who placed an interdict upon artists not belonging to their corporation, had driven Charles Lebrun, himself the son of a master, to agitate for its foundation. Colbert added to it the Academy of Music and the Academy of Architecture, and created the French School of Painting at Rome. Beside the palace, for a long time past dedicated to this establishment, lived, for more than thirty-five years, Le Poussin, the first and the greatest of all the painters of that French school which was beginning to spring up, whilst the Italian school, though blooming still in talent and strength, was forgetting more and more every day the nobleness, the purity, and the severity of taste which had carried to the highest pitch the art of the fifteenth century the tradition of the masters in vogue in italy of the caracci of guido of paul veronese had reached paris with simon vouet who had long lived at rome he was succeeded there by a frenchman quote, whom from his grave and thoughtful air you would have taken for a father of sorbonne says m vitet in his charming vie de la sueur quote, his black eye beneath his thick eyebrow nevertheless flashed forth a glance full of poesy and youth his manner of living was not less surprising than his personal appearance he might be seen walking in the streets of rome tablets in hand hitting off by a stroke or two of his pencil at one time the antique fragments he came upon at another the gestures the attitudes the faces of the persons who presented themselves in his path sometimes in the morning he would sit on the terrace of trinity del monte beside another frenchman five or six years younger but already known for rendering landscapes with such fidelity such fresh and marvellous beauty that all the italian masters gave place to him and that after two centuries he has not yet met his rival end quote. Quote, of these two artists the older evidently exercised over the other the superiority which genius has over talent the smallest hints of le poussin were received by claude lorrain with deference and respect and yet to judge from the prices at which they severally sold their pictures the landscape painter had for the time an indisputable superiority claude gelet called lorrain had fled when quite young from the shop of the confectioner with whom his parents had placed him he had found means of getting to rome there he worked there he lived and there he died returning but once to france in the height of his renown for just a few months without even enriching his own land with any great number of his works nearly all of them remained on foreign soil le poussin born at andelys in fifteen ninety three made his way with great difficulty to italy he was by that time thirty years old and had no more desire than claude to return to france where painting was with difficulty beginning to obtain a standing his reputation however had penetrated thither king louis the thirteenth was growing weary of simon vouet's factitious lustre he wanted le poussin to go to paris the painter for a long while held out the king insisted quote, i shall go said le poussin like one sentence to be sawn in halves and severed in twain end quote. he passed eighteen months in france welcomed enthusiastically lodged at the tuileries magnificently paid but exposed to the jealousies of simon vouet and his pupils worried thwarted frozen to death by the hoar-frosts of paris he took the road back to rome in november sixteen forty two on the pretext of going to fetch his wife and did not return any more he had left in france some of his masterpieces models of that new independent and conscientious art faithfully studied from nature in all its italian grandeur and from the treasures of the antique quote, how did you arrive at such perfection people would ask le poussin quote, by neglecting nothing the painter would say in the same way newton was soon to discover the great laws of the physical world quote, by always thinking thereon end quote. during le poussin's stay at paris he had taken as a pupil eustache le sueur who had been trained in the studio of simon vouet but had been struck from the first with the incomparable genius and proud independence of the master sent to him by fate alone he had supported le poussin in his struggle against the envious alone he entered upon the road which revealed itself to him whilst he studied under le poussin he was poor he had great difficulty in managing to live the delicacy the purity the suavity of his genius could shine forth in their entirety nowhere but in the convent of the carthusians whose cloister he was commissioned to decorate 
there he painted the life of st bruno breathing into this almost mystical work all the religious poetry of his soul and of his talent ever delicate and chaste even in the allegorical figures of mythology with which he before long adorned the hotel lambert he had returned to his favourite pursuits embellishing the churches of paris with incomparable works when overwhelmed by the loss of his wife, and exhausted by the painful efforts of his genius, he died at thirty-seven, in that convent of the Carthusians which he glorified with his talent, at the same time that he edified the monks with his religious zeal. Le Sueur succumbed in a struggle too rude and too rough for his pure and delicate nature. Le Brun had returned from that Italy which Le Sueur had never been able to reach. The old rivalry, fostered in the studio of Simon Vouet, was already being renewed between the two artists the angelic art gave place to the worldly and the earthly le sueur died le brun found himself master of the position assured by anticipation and as it were by instinct of sovereign dominion under the sway of the young king for whom he had been created old philip of champagne alone might have disputed with him the foremost rank he had passionately admired le poussin he had attached himself de le sueur Quote, never says m vitet had he sacrificed to fashion never had he fallen into the vagaries of the degenerate italian style End quote this upright simple painstaking soul this inflexible conscience looking continually into the human face had preserved in his admirable portraits the life and the expression of nature which he was incessantly trying to seize and reproduce le brun was preferred to him as the first painter to the king by louis the fourteenth himself philip of champagne was delighted thereat he lived in retirement in fidelity to his friends of port royal whose austere and vigorous lineaments he loved to trace beginning with m de saint cyran and ending with his own daughter, sister Suzanne, who was restored to health by the prayers of mother Agnes Arnaud. Le Brun was as able a courtier as he was a good painter. The clever arrangement of his pictures, the richness and brilliancy of his talent, his faculty for applying art to industry, secured him with Louis the Fourteenth a sway which lasted as long as his life. He was first painter to the king. He was director of the Gobelin and of the Academy of Painting. Quote, he let nothing be done by the other artists but according to his own designs and suggestions. The worker in tapestry, the decorative painter, the statuary, the goldsmith, took their models from him. All came from him, all flowed from his brain, all bore his imprint. The painter followed the king's ideas, being entirely after his own heart. For fourteen years he worked for Louis the Fourteenth, representing his life and his conquests at Versailles, painting for the Louvre the victories of Alexander, which were engraved almost immediately by Audrin and Edelink. He was jealous of the royal favour, sensitive and haughty towards artists, honestly concerned for the king's glory and for the tasks confided to himself. The growing reputation of Mignard, whom Louvois had brought back from Rome, troubled and disquieted Le Brun. In vain did the king encourage him. Le Brun, already ill, said in the presence of Louis the Fourteenth that fine pictures seemed to become finer after the painter's death. Quote, Do not you be in a hurry to die, Monsieur Le Brun, said the king. We esteem your pictures now quite as highly as posterity can. End quote. The small gallery at Versailles had been entrusted to Mignard. Le Brun withdrew to Montmorency, where he died in 1690, jealous of Mignard at the end as he had been of Le Sueur at the outset of his life. Mignard became first painter to the king. He painted the ceiling of Val de Grasse, which was celebrated by Molière, but it was as a painter of portraits that he excelled in France. Quote, M. Mignard does them best, said Le Poussin not long before, with lofty good nature, though his heads are all paint, without force or character. End quote. To Mignard succeeded Rigaud as portrait painter, worthy to preserve the features of Bossuet and Fenelon. The unity of organization, the brilliancy of style, the imposing majesty which the king's taste had everywhere stamped about him, upon art as well as upon literature, were by this time beginning to decay simultaneously with the old age of Louis XIV, with the reverses of his arms, and the increasing gloominess of his court. The artists who had illustrated his reign were dying one after another, as well as the orators and the poets. The sculptor James Sarrazin had been gone some time. Puget and the Anguier were dead, as well as Mansart, Perrault, and Le Nôtre. Girardon had but a few months to live. Only Coisevaux was destined to survive the king, whose statue he had many a time moulded. The great age was disappearing slowly and sadly, throwing out to the last some noble gleams, like the aged king who had constantly served as its centre and guide, like olden France, which he had crowned with its last and its most splendid wreath. End of section 74. End of chapter 48. End of a popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 5, by François Guizot.